I'm Stephen Foskett with uh, Tech Field Day here at the Open Networking User Group uh, meeting in New York, uh, October 2013. And uh, one of the cool things that happens here at Onug is that we get to see uh, people uh, who have new ideas, and uh, you know, it's, there's a lot of interaction between uh, you know end users. And um, one of the people that uh, caught our attention here is uh, Andy Volmi. Here's uh, he's uh, working. Uh, with, uh, from Yale, um, he's working on the, the Maple uh, project. And he's gonna just run through a quick demo of Maple and uh, figured we would just catch it, uh, catch it on film. Uh, thanks, Steve. So I'm Andy Volman, I'm from Yale. And um, I'm here with Srini. And I'm gonna you know, go through Maple, uh, talk about, I'll, I'll first I'll talk a little bit about um, where the project started, what we're trying to accomplish. And then I'll just launch into the demo and show you how it really works. Um, right, so, so Maple is, a, is this research project um, that I've been working on during my PhD at Yale. And um, so it, it's an open flow controller, uh, network controller. And um, if we look at you know, controllers today, there's sort of two, um, or SDN systems today, there's sort of two camps. You've got um, you know, protocols like open flow and controllers that are sort of very close to OpenFlow and the, the southbound interface. And they're very flexible. Um, you can use them for lots of different uh, forwarding purposes and network management purposes. Um, but they're also very complicated and very hard to use. And it takes a lot of effort to build a solution using those tools. Um, on the other hand, we have tools like um, you know, northbound APIs that are much simpler, right? uh, for example, the quantum API that's part of OpenStack, or maybe some something like a static flow pusher. So it's you know much more uh, much easier to use for say an operational user, um, but also much more limited in what you can do. And uh, what Maple tries to do is find a new point in the space and to try to be um, very flexible, you know, as hopefully you know close to as flexible as. Um, allowing the user to do everything that they could do with OpenFlow, um, but also much easier to use. And we do that by basically automating a lot of things, that a lot of tasks that you would have to do if you were programming directly with OpenFlow. So the kind of thing that's really hard that makes, that makes programming with OpenFlow and Floodlight complicated is managing all the low-level details about you know, flow tables, basically. You have all these switches in your network. Each one of them has this flow table, uh, or multiple flow tables even. And they have, you know, uh, each, each, the flow table consists of this prioritized sequence of, you know, match action pairs. And the match itself is very complicated. So you have to decide on all these details, like what the priorities should be, which rules, how they should be masked, which actions, et cetera. So this is really complicated. It's really easy to both introduce errors and um, get bad performance if you don't configure these correctly. So here's a really simple example of a kind of bug that might happen if, if you sort of program this in a naive way. So let's say you have a controller that um, basically does a little bit of access control and then like shortest path routing. Right? So you might have this packet handler that says, OK, is this packet to TCP destination 22? And if so, then I want to drop it. And if not, then I'll just forward it along with the next hop, uh, along the shortest path. So that's kind of sort of what the user goal is. And the way they um, might translate this into actual open flow rules is to say, well, let's use, you know, for the uh, port 22 traffic, we'll use, you know, match on. TCP destination 22, right? And then action drop. So that's very straightforward. For the other kinds of traffic, you might have a match on the particular destination um, address and then send it to the next hop. Um, but of course, here, actually, we have to, we really should say that this is not, this is for TCP destination non 22 packets, right? But OpenFlow doesn't support this kind of negation. So instead, we have to try to use, we can use priorities to encode. Um, how the rules match and sort of encode this negation. So we can put the drop, the access control rules at a priority high, and then the other rules at priority low. That way, the access control rules will fire first and catch the, those kinds of packets. 
So unfortunately, there's actually a bug in this code. And um, to see it, we can sort of picture, sort of watch what happens if we were having this controller um, control a single switch. Right? So if we have, say, you know, the red packet arriving first to destination A, port 80, it'll get sent to the controller. And the controller inserts a sort of shortest path rule right, at a low priority. And then later, um, then the packet is sent back to the switch and you know, it gets forwarded further. So let's say the other packet arrives. And now you, know, you really wanted this to go back to the controller so that you could insert the, the appropriate rule. But it actually matches this, the rule that you've already inserted. And so it gets misclassified and forward, forwarded along the shortest path. So this might be a, a security violation. So just because of the order um, of, of installation, you could get these kinds of problems. So you have to be really careful. So today, basically, you, you have in these SDM systems, you have sort of low-level things. For example, the OpenFlow protocol and OpenFlow libraries. Um, you typically implement some kind of northbound API for your administrator. And then the SDN programmer kind of bridges the gap between those two things. So they, there's a lot of, of, of code here. Um, sort of translating the northbound API and managing all these rules, right? So what Maple, with Maple, um, so we're proposing to introduce a new intermediate abstraction layer that automates, so we call it, um, and this intermediate abstraction, we call it an algorithmic policy. And we now move the, all the rule management and rule compilation under the hood, and, and so completely automate it. And we can generate correct and optimized rule sets. Um, and so the idea of the algorithmic policy is actually really simple. Um, so basically, we want the user to write a function in a general purpose language, for example, Java or Python, et cetera. And it should describe how a packet should be routed, not how the flow tables are configured. Right? So you can, for example, take this, it could be you know, a, a function f. And it takes a state, for example, like network state, like topology, and, and things like host locations, and takes the packet and then computes a route. And that's it. Nothing about flow tables. Right? And then Maple will ensure that the network actually behaves as if F was applied to every packet, even as the state changes over time. So that's, that's the idea. So that was pretty you know, abstract. So let me show you how this actually works. So I've got this, um, I've got uh, Mininet here, um, started up a Mininet session, and that's virtualized a bunch of switches. And I can show you the, the topologies here. So we have like five hosts and four switches, and they're connected in some topology. Um, now I can start up um, Maple like this. Basically, you say, you know, Maple, and you can specify the programming language. We actually support multiple programming languages, and I'll get back to um, exactly uh, what that what the program looks like, but you basically can start the controller, and it will bring up both a command line and a GUI. And the first thing Maple does is just basically collect information about the network. Okay, so it collects a topology, it looks at you know switches and ports in the network, etc. Um, so for example, we can look at the here we can look on the command line and get all the information about ports. We can get you know links, etc. Um, now the interesting thing, the, the thing that sets Maple apart is how you actually build new kind of new SDN systems, how you program with it. So let me show you the program that we actually are running here. This is uh, a Java class called SP, and let me actually show you that code. So here's the code. So basically, this you write a this is the entire controller. This is 30 lines of code. Okay. Um, this class SB extends a Maple function, and then it has a single function in here called the, the packet handler, right? And it takes a packet and returns a route, right? And what this one does is you'll see that it, you know, for example, here it looks at the host location of the source, the sender. It looks at some network state, for example, switches and links. Um, it looks at the edge ports. It then computes, uh, you know, a, um, constructs a graph. And this is arbitrary. We didn't. We happen to provide some some toolkit for writing, you know, routing algorithms. But but this could be anything, right? You write here. 
Um, and then it distinguishes between two cases. It says, well, if the destination location is unknown, then I will broadcast it. And that's what this is saying. It's saying multicast from the source along the spanning tree um, to the edge ports. And this could be, again, this could be, you know, this part here, the spanning tree algorithm could be anything you want to write. We didn't, we don't know anything about this. We just provide you this as a library. So in the other case, if you actually know where the destination is, then you can compute, say, a shortest path between the source and the destination, and then return a unicast route. So that's it. So um, what's interesting here is that in this entire 30 lines of code, we haven't seen, there's nothing about rules anywhere here, right? Open flow rules. We're not saying how they're constructed. We don't say how they're updated. We don't say how they depend on network state, anything like that. Um, and this is where you know, Maple has um, some very um, sophisticated algorithms and data structures that we've written about in our academic papers that actually can learn, can observe this program um, and analyze its behavior and then build an intermediate representation of this program that it can then use to compile very efficient flow tables. So let me show you how that actually works. So if we've got this one running here, and we look at the forwarding tables, right? and it starts out with nothing, because there's no traffic going through the network or anything. So now, let's say if we were to ping from one host to another. Um, OK, so the pings are going through. So let's say if we look at the forwarding tables, we should now see some, some forwarding entries. So for example, um, this host one that I'm pinging from is actually located on this port three of switch one. And so you actually see that it, it computed those flow tables for that, right? One for the broadcast address and another one for the, the specific, the other, the other host. And one, one interesting thing to note here is that it only matched on source and, and destination addresses. It didn't match on all the other fields that might have been matched in that rule, right? And it does it because it actually can tell that in this, this um, function, you, it only depends on the source and the destination. Um, and so there's lots of other you know, um, things that we could do here. We could add, for example, it would be really easy to just say add, um, EC, change this to being ECMP, and then you get a new kind of routing. Right? And, and this would be done without any um, rewriting of rules, um, for example. So, so that is... Um, basically routing, and, but you can do a lot more things than routing, right? So anything that you could, you know, any function you could write um, on this packet in Java, you could, you could implement in this way. So for example, access control is another typical example. So let's say I just add a very simple access control rule here. Um, so we'll do this. So we'll just say, so we just had this one line that says, you know, look, if the packet, the TCP destination of the packet equals, say, 22, like SSH, then we'll do, we'll discard the packet, right? So we just add this to the beginning, and now um, just recompile that Java code, and then we'll restart our, um, actually, let me stop the ping for a second, okay. Um, rerun the controller, and now it's running the, new, the updated code. Um, so let's see here. So now we'll look at the, the forwarding tables, and they're, they start out entry, uh, empty again. And now if we do the ping, for example, and we come back and we look at forwarding tables, we see um, slightly more complicated entries, right? So we see that... Um, the same one as before, so source and destination, right? But we also see a higher priority rule that matches on the extra fields, right? So Maple figured out um, that we need this extra rule. It figured out what priority it should be at, right? And what's interesting here is it has a question mark for the action. That means we don't actually know, Maple doesn't actually know what will happen, you know, what the program wants to do on that packet, but it knows that it needs to go back to the controller and ask it if if it ever gets a packet like that. So for example, if we were to then say, um, try to SSH um, to four, what we'll see is, um, and now we looked at the forwarding tables, now it's filled in, right? 
now this entry that we were looking at before that used to have a question mark has been filled in, and it says just drop the packet. Right? So dynamically, what Maple is doing is learning about as packets go through this, this uh, function, we understand the control flow of the program, and then we can compile more and more um, you know, full flow tables for, for the, um, yeah. Um, so, so this function depends on um, network state, right? So it depends on switches, uh, the topology, edge ports, and all this stuff. And whenever this changes, we'll need to update our routes, very likely. And so Maple automatically um, captures the dependency between you know, the, forward, the forwarding rules that you add or the, the control flow computations and the state of the network. And that's actually useful in implementing northbound APIs as well, because northbound APIs often have um, some state. So you might have like various sort of tables or sets or variables that define how um, the state of the northbound API, for example, um, which subnets, which Macs are in which subnets, et cetera. Right? So what you can do with Maple is declare, define your state, what tables and sets you have um, that are part of your northbound API, and then use those in your packet processing function. And whenever those change, it will update all the, the forwarding tables. So let me show you an example of that. So, um, so here I've got a little bit of code. Let me just, in the interest of time, I'll just copy and paste it. So for example, let's say that we want to have a set of bad Macs, Macs that we want to de deny. And so basically the northbound API is the administrator can say at any time, look, this, this Mac is bad. This Mac is good. And we want to automatically clean up all the code, the forwarding tables, whenever this changes. So it's very easy to define this. We say um, declare a maple set, a set of hosts. In the constructor, we can say, you know, look, this bad set, just construct a new set with this name. Um, and then we can add, this line of code says, I want to edit, be able to edit this on the command line interface. Um, and then um, here, we'll add a line to our packet processor, just add a single line here, kind of like the same access control as before, and we'll say, look, if the bad set um, contains um, either the source or the sender or the receiver, then we'll deny it. Okay. So, okay, so we add this, we go back and we just compile that class and we'll restart Maple. Okay. So now, <coughs> um, now, let's see. So if we look at here, now we can actually get at this information here. We can say bad hosts and it shows us the list of bad hosts, which is empty at first. So say we were to ping from H1 to H4, it goes through just fine. If we ping from H1 to H5, that's also going through just fine. But now if we say bad hosts, say insert five. Oh wait, actually, let me show you the forwarding tables, right? We have lots of forwarding table entries. Um, if we now add a new bad host, then the ping stops, right? The ping stopped here, and if we look at the forwarding table entries, it was cleaned up. All the state that related to, you know, that depended on five not being a bad host was cleared. Now if we go back and we say, you know, delete five, let's say five is now okay again, the ping starts, we look at the fibs, and everything's back. So, so this is useful both for depending on southbound state and northbound state, and it deals with all this very com complex um, process of cleaning up the state and making sure your rules are up to date. Um, so yeah, so that's that's um, where we are today. We are we've got a lot of things that we're a lot of features that we're still adding um, that are in the pipeline, but we think that it's already uh, pretty useful and very interesting, and we would like to get this out of our research lab and actually into you know, in the hands of some other potential sort of bleeding edge users and see what they think, get their feedback. So that's, that's our status. Great job.